Okay, we've done. We're done talking with about. Okay, we're done talking about sperm and how to make it and normal sperm as well. Now let's talk about accessory glands. So again, accessory does not mean they're not important, but they're not part of that main reproductive tract, running from the testes to the external urethral opening. But they are along the way. So what we have here, the first one they encounters is the semin are the seminal glands or the seminal vesicles. Again, same term for the I like seminal vesicles. It kind of just rolls off the tongue. But the thing is, like seminal glands, what happens here? These combine with the duct just before the ejaculatory duct here. These add additional fluids as well. And then you have the prostate gland. Again, you have that ejaculatory duct running through that and the urethra running from the urinary system. And then you have the bulbal urethral gland, these very tiny pairs of glands. We're only seeing one again because this is a sagittal section, but also known as Cowper's gland. Same thing, just a more taking the name out of that term. And these are three main glands that provide additional chemicals and fluids on the as you move sperm all the way to the to the external urethral or, or, orifice external urethral orifice. Okay, so the seminal glands or the seminal vesicles, so they actually produce the majority of the volume of ejaculate, so around 60%. Don't worry too much about the exact numbers, but know that it does provide the majority of the ejaculate. So we have alkaline secretions. So the thing about this, typically urine on the average is a little is acidic. So if you have it coming out through the same, remember now we have the ejaculatory duct combined with the prostate urethra and now becoming the same urethra so if there's already some residual acid here maybe it's, it makes sense to have some alkaline secretions and the other thing is that the inside of the vagina and uterus is also acidic as well so this helps to neutralize it and keep the pH balanced so the sperm don't die due to stresses from acidic pHs or acidic pH it also has fructose. So fructose is a monosaccharide, it is a sugar, and it can be used by sperm. So this helps to nourish and keep sperm alive and, and have adequate nutrition. And prostaglandins, which are also important, well, paracrine factors and chemicals that also help sperm along. So again, majority of the back ejaculate. Now then there's the prostate gland. Even though it's bigger than the other glands, it only produces about a third of the ejaculate, about 30%. But it doesn't mean it's not important. It actually provides a lot of enzymes. So not only are there barriers on the outside of the egg, even just entering the cervix or and vagina and cervix and the uterus, there are many barriers to the sperm along the way. So the, you have these enzymes that also help the sperm along. We also have zinc that helps sperm and then the copper's glands, they actually secrete a very small amount of the ejaculate. And it's more like a thick, sticky mucus that's very alkaline. And also more sugars that help to say, sustain sperm as well. So this also helps with the consistency of sperm. It's not just a simple watery fluid. It does have some bodies and thickness to it. Now here is the anatomy. So take, say you take a penis and then you just do a cross section. Ouch, right, if you're a guy. But what we have here, I like this picture because it looks like a monkey's face, right? You have two eyes in the mouth. But what we have here, we, again, that thartos muscle is actually extending all the way here. So not only does the testes contract when you have cold temperature, but what else contracts during cold temperature? Hey, if you have cold temperature and the thartos contracts, then that's also going to cause the penis to contract and retract toward the body. But you have these two structures, this pair called the corpora cavernosa. So again, corpora cavernosum would only be one of these. And what we have here in the middle, what are these? Well, they're red, so they're actually, and or actually rewind that a bit. There's a corpus spongiosum. So this part right here, not continuous with the corpora cavernosa. These are two separate tubes separate from the corpus spongiosum. Now this is a deep artery of the penis. Again, this is an artery carrying blood away from the heart and now it's toward the penis. So this is the part that fills with blood during erection. So this corpora cavernosa are going to fill up with blood, and this is causes the rigidity you see during an erection. Now, this deep artery is not here, and why is that? Well, as this fills up with blood, what happens? Well, it's going to cause increased pressure. What if you had increased pressure inside of here? 
or what's in actually what's running through that corpus spongiosum? So you actually have the spongy urethra. So again, remember this is where both urine and ejaculate comes out from. So the funny thing about this is like if you had this filling up with blood, this would cause increased pressure. And say you do have fluids flowing through here, but what if this was totally filled with blood? Well, it start to push on the inside of the lumen of the urethra, so it would pinch off that vessel. So then that kind of defeats the purpose, right? So if you have an erection and you're pinching off this urethra, say it was being filled with blood, well, then you won't be able to ejaculate because there's too much pressure from all the blood inside the corpus spongiosum. So this part does not fill and become engorged with blood during an erection. So again, corpus spongiosum does have a blood supply. You still need to keep things alive in there, but it's not going to be totally have all the pressure and blood you see in the corpora cavernosa. Now, hormonal regulation. So this is where 